Thanks, LA Progressive friends and family. Today, we're so happy to have met virtually Andrea Mazzarino, who we've been publishing for quite a while, thanks to our friend Tom Engelhardt and his Tom Dispatch, which uh, 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 sends his her articles around. So, Andrea, you are the one of the co-founders of Brown University's Cost of War. Could you tell us what what that pilot, what's that program about? Program started back in 2011, and its broad goal has been to make available uh, the wide range of costs of the U.S.'s decision to go to war in response to 9-11. And Costs of War defines uh, those costs very broadly. So the cost to the federal budget, which is um, $8 trillion and counting, uh, the cost to human lives, um, the direct costs are about a million uh, now. Um, the indirect costs like illness and injury from depleted infrastructure, from famine, and then also opportunity costs back here in the U.S. The project has done a lot to show how many people um, could have gotten jobs back here at home um, in sectors like clean energy and education, um, things we need more people working in if we had not gone to war in response to those attacks yeah. and stayed at war. Yeah, you know, I just, I marvel. When I first discovered um, the cost of war, I just, I, I'm a person that loves graphs and charts and data, and also a person that is just overwhelmed with war and what it does. And, you know, I just thought that uh, your project just does such a wonderful job of graphically depicting the ways in which the United States spends taxpayer dollars. And, and what do we get in return? So uh, you have a piece that is currently um, on the LA Progressive uh, entitled The Fifth Horseman of the Apocalypse, where um, you talk about uh, one of those uh, indirect costs, which is um, hunger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, especially today, as we think about what the people of Gaza are experiencing, um, clearly, hunger is huge, and and your piece really sheds light on the connection, you know, the, the nexus between conflict, war, and hunger. Do you want to talk a little bit about what you wrote in that piece? Sure. So I did um, highlight Gaza because that conflict, for good reason, has been all over the news, and young people have been really, uh, really strong activists on Israel's assault there and the way we ate it. But by and large, I wanna call attention to the fact that famine is a very common cost of war. Um, often many more people die of hunger and hunger related illnesses than do people in direct combat. And that has been the case in many of the post 9-11 conflicts that the US has engaged in, such as our involvement in Somalia in the late 2000s, early 2010s, which um, has ripple effects today in um, the many people facing um, acute malnutrition there um, because of the way we have destroyed infrastructure and um, also blocked aid shipments, similar to the way the Israeli military is doing um, currently um, in Gaza. So I wanted to call attention to you know the dozens of places where the U.S. still fights or arms um, national militaries and the way that hunger emerges as an indirect cost of war that is often more significant than combat itself. Yeah. So, so uh, it seems like forever that the, the United States has been putting all its treasure into war. I mean, certainly 9-11, but I mean, going back to when I was a kid in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, can you can you explain, go into some of the detail of what it costs 
to to pursue these endless wars and what we could have been doing instead. So I'm not going to give a breakdown of the numbers because those are always being updated and I don't want to make an error right now, but we've spent more than eight million, uh, eight, sorry, eight trillion federal dollars um, on these post 9-11 conflicts. And that includes uh, that includes Pentagon spending, that includes additions to the Pentagon base budget. So all of the office jobs, all of the money appropriated for arms development, that includes um, national state national guards. Um, it includes USAID money to try to rebuild uh, places where we've been at war, like Afghanistan and Iraq and others. Um, it includes um, debt or um, money committed to the VA um, in the decades to come in order to care for the generation of veterans that um, comes home um, wounded and ill and may live with um, various um, conditions that need care um, well into older age. So those um, federal dollars cover many of those costs and more, um, but also one thing that I think many Americans forget is that war does not create jobs. It actually, when seen as an opportunity cost, it takes away from the ways in which we could be employing Americans at home if that same money that we spend abroad were invested in sectors like clean energy, education, and healthcare. Um, so if we had taken the same money that we have put into these foreign wars and invested them at home, we would have created millions more jobs. And this is deviating beyond financial costs, but we all know now how much we could have benefited from more doctors, better equipped hospitals, and more ventilators um, now that we've been through this pandemic and lost more than a million Americans in it. Yeah. You know, in this article, you talk about the research and that you um, have been mostly involved in, which is studying Russia. Mm -hmm. You want to talk a little bit about, you know, how that um, area of, of study sort of launched you into this Sure. Well, I I researched a number of topics in Russia, but one big theme um, in my work as an academic and then later with Human Rights Watch was the effect of depleted social services or the effect of war on depleted social services at home. So Russia, like the U.S., has its own counterterrorism operations at the south of its border in um, countries like Uzbekistan and um, in Georgia. And, you know, counterterrorism is broadly defined, um, but it also has counterinsurgency operations in Dagestan and uh, Chechnya. And what a lot of that has amounted to, when, you know, spending more than 4% of their defense budget on war has amounted to very impoverished healthcare system, a very impoverished healthcare system, um, a lack of housing, and sort of, especially most recently, um, since it attacked Ukraine in 2022, um, uh, an ability of President Vladimir Putin to consolidate his rule um, under the rationale that um, he's a wartime president, and anybody speaking out against his war is a is a detractor and a traitor. And it's allowed him to um, imprison thousands um, for um, for for protesting the war and and to thus consolidate his rule. So following Russia and be, living there for years, witnessing the opportunity costs of war and the ways in which rev reverence for the military and fear about Russia's foreign wars has changed its culture. Um, it was a natural 
progression for me to also look at our wars at home. So, so as we speak, the Re Republican National Convention is going on. Um, and the Biden administration obviously strongly supports the war in Ukraine and progressives complain that, that Joe Biden's full-throated support for Netanyahu and Israel is prolonging that war. And yet you argue that that uh, a Donald a new Donald Trump presidency would be even worse. Can you can you just say why? Well, Trump moved the U.S. embassy to the contested area of Jerusalem. Um, he has been supportive of Israel's expansion, uh, that the expansion of, of Israeli settlements in the West Bank, which, as we know, are the source of a lot of um, is the source of a lot of armed violence there. And he also would short circuit our ability to protest those and other issues here at home because he has made it very clear that he would invoke the Insurrection Act to quell um, protests um, like the ones that happened at Columbia, at Berkeley, at campuses around the country. So not only would could we expect more of the same in terms of Trump's support for Israel, um, and specifically his support for Netanyahu, because I want to make a distinction there. Um, but I think that he would make it impossible for us to use the usual mechanisms like peaceful protest to solve that and other problems that concern us here at home. I want to um, take this conversation back to a uh, cost of war, to the, to the site. Um, sure. So you said that it was established in 2011. What was your um, main objective? And do you feel like you've come close to providing what it was that you were attempting to provide? The main objective was to help Americans go into their decisions as voters and as citizens with their eyes wide open when it comes to how the US engages in foreign conflict. Um, the project has made that information as accessible, I think, as, as it can be, um, especially by um, sort of collating numbers of war dead and war wounded from various sources. And it's also pressured the US government to make uh, the costs of war more transparent um, to taxpayers, the fiscal costs of war more transparent to taxpayers. Um, there's a lot left to do. I think in the years since I helped found the project, I've just been, I've been a writer. I don't directly organize the project at all anymore. So I'm not the best person to talk about goals. But I do think that the project keeps expanding. It keeps doing really exciting new things like highlighting the cost to contractors and their families, like highlighting the extent to which the government bleeds money to private corporations. In other words, it does keep pace with changes in the way we fight wars and that I'm proud of it for. So as a, as a Vietnam veteran who's gotten various kinds of care from the Veterans Administration over the years, uh, and she'll tell you that I have a diagnosis for PTSD, although I keep it on the down low. I, I'm fascinated by your work with, uh, with uh, veterans in the PTSD outreach outpatient clinic. Can, can you tell me what kind of work you did with that? Well, that was way back when I was in, um, an intern um, training to be a clinical social worker. Um, but it's how I first realized that I would really like that sort of work um, with veterans and their families. Um, so that was about 10 months um, back in 2018 at the outpatient clinic in uh, the Seattle area, um, focusing on sort of specialty outpatient therapy um, with um, vets from all branches. And I guess what I liked about it was the extent to which you're able to target 
um, events in vets' lives um, that continue to haunt them to this day and help them work through those events in their minds in a new way that maybe helps folks blame themselves less for the death that they saw, um, come to peace with how little control they had over the circumstances of their fighting. Um, in cases where it was vets who survived sexual violence at the hands of their um, compatriots, help them to feel safe again in communities of other veterans that were different from the ones they fought with. Um, that kind of thing was really rewarding. And I think that vets are the type of people that are like ready for it to try anything. So it was like, even though they were distressing topics that we were dealing with, it was it, it was always people who were like really willing to do hard things. So I liked it. And as a private practice therapist, to this day, I work with many um, who impress me with their ability to make meaning out of really crummy situations that they found themselves in. Well, Andrea, it's such, been such a pleasure uh, talking to you and um, seeing one of the faces behind Costa Boy, even though you've uh, published for a long time with the LA Progressive, we like we said, we've actually never met. And Costa Boy is, at, is absolutely hands down one of my favorite places to go. Um, I especially love the way that you're able to show what we could have gotten for the same money, you know, the, the number of kids that had, that could have gotten uh, gone to school or had improved education or school lunch programs or just the way that we spend money to destroy when we could spend money in productive ways is so um, clearly seen at your site. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate that. Well, so very good to talk to you, Andrea. We hope to do it again. And, Likewise. and thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Dick. It was nice to meet you both. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.